Welcome to week one of our brand new series called Hope is Here. If you're a guest with us this morning and you've like researched and talked about like, man, I want to know what this church is all about, and you went to our website or you went to our Facebook, you're like, this is not the face I saw there, right? Okay. If you're not a guest with us, you know I'm not Adam. Adam Jones is our senior minister. He is gone this week. Uh, uh, celebrating his anniversary with his wife. And so I'm Keenan. I'm the student and worship pastor here, and I'm glad I get to uh, take a time with you this morning to dive into God's Word. So we're in this brand new series called Hope is Here. We're going to be spending some time between now and Easter talking about how God has given us glimpses of hope, not only in the future, but in the present, and how he wants to be a part of our lives and change us and do great and wonderful things. We're going to talk about one of my favorite topics this morning, and it's happiness. And we'll talk about that more in a little bit, why it's one of my favorite topics. We're going to be in Psalm chapter 1 this morning. It's on page 369 in those blue Bibles in your pews. If you don't have a Bible, we would love for you to take this home. It's our gift to you. Take it home with you. We believe that God's Word is powerful and effective and transforms lives, and it only happens if you use it and you open it up and you dig into what God has to say through it. Psalm chapter 1, in the first three verses we're going to read together this morning. It's all we're going to get through this morning, because I have lots of things to talk about in terms of it. Ready? Psalm 1, verse 1, it says this, Blessed, or blessed, is the one who does not walk and step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, who, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Would you pray with me? God, we want to be transformed by your word this morning. We want to do a good job of coming before you and allowing you to teach us this morning. Thank you for today. And may we use every moment for your glory. Amen. I said that we're talking about one of my favorite topics, and it's happiness. And the reason is most people who know me know that I usually have a smile on my face, and a lot of people kind of interchange happiness for Keenan. It's true. Uh, What you see right now is kind of what you get 24-7 unless I'm asleep. This is Keenan, right? All craziness, all uh, hyped, all coffee, it's all good, Right? And it's wonderful things, and I love talking about happiness. Because what I've learned in my life is that I really like to be happy. It's true. So I do whatever it takes to make Keenan happy, and I pursue it. Sometimes I pursue things like food. So after this service, I'm going to go find lunch, because it's going to make me happy, right? Or like when we have church gatherings and there's food, I'm most likely going to be there, because food makes me happy. One of the other things that makes me happy is I, for a season of my life, I pursued awards. So I was like in Cub Scouts, and they had these things called Pinewood Derbies where you make these cars, and my car had to be the fastest, the best looking to win all the prizes. So that way, I could shove in everyone else's face how good I am at this, right? When that wasn't good enough any longer, I went and played soccer. Yes, believe it or not, I played soccer and was pretty good at it. I know I have a belly now. I know, but it was great. I was really good at it. I was really good at defense, not offense. That's where they put me a lot of times. And I got rewards for it, for being the best defensive player. And then it got boring. So then, if you know me, I also really like playing card games and board games. I play Monopoly. My wife will not play Monopoly with me because I like to not only win, I like to destroy her for victory. It's great. She won't play Monopoly with me, though any longer. So when those things got boring, I would run towards things like I ran towards um, trying to get a diploma, right? So I got my high school diploma, my education. I was like, look at this. It's really cool. And then it was boring. It wasn't cool anymore. It wasn't the new thing. So I went to college and I went and pursued another degree. And I'm like, look at this degree. It's awesome and it's cool. And then it got boring after a while too, right? Because it's just a piece of paper. And I've learned that I like to pursue happiness for my own standards, for my own joy. So much, in fact, that the way that it shows you the best is 
through my cars I've owned, okay? When I was 15, I worked for Chick-fil-A, and I amassed as much wealth as a 15-year-old could do, and I bought my first car for $500. It was great, and it should be on the screen. It's a four-door Geo Metro. Four-door Geo Metro, 1996, that thing. I spent like $10 every other week filling it up with gas. It was awesome. Believe it or not, I could fit an entire drum set in the back of that car. It was amazing. I don't know how I did it, but I did it. It was awesome. Until my friends started driving and got better cars and made fun of me in my car. So I did the only thing that a high school boy could do, and I upgraded to a 1996 Dodge Intrepid. That was also green. Ooh, it was a beast of a boat of a car. Yes, I think I could have taken that thing on water and it would have floated. It was huge. Um, But it was awesome. And I drove this thing forever until it also became boring. It was no longer fun. And I couldn't haul things. I liked hauling things and people. So I needed something that could haul things and people. And I did the thing that I knew best to do. So I went to the dealer and I bought a minivan. That's true. I drove a minivan for a while. It was amazing. And it hauled everything I wanted. And when I didn't want to haul things, I'd put the seats up and I'd haul people. It was awesome. I took them, we partied all the time for Jesus. It was great in that minivan. Until I decided, no fun anymore. Minivans are no longer awesome. You may be thinking they're never awesome, Keenan, but I did. I thought they were awesome, okay? I, I grew up in a family with five kids and two adults, and so we had eight passenger vans and 15 passenger vans, so that's what I grew up driving, so a minivan was small for me, okay? So then I upgraded this last fall to my newest car that my friends still make fun of me for, and it's a Prius. I am one of those people now. I drive a Prius, woohoo, and it's great and awesome. I get great gas mileage and... I'll take you to lunch in it sometime. It'll be awesome. So that's where I'm at, though. I trade all these things, but I've learned about myself that I really like pursuing things that make Keenan happy. And I think if we took a moment, if we had lunch sometime together, or if we went to Sonic and grabbed a drink together, I know that I think you pursue the same things. It may not be a car, but you pursue the same things because you want to be happy. It's kind of how we're hardwired. We seek out whatever it is that makes us happy. So the question I have for us to think about this morning is where do we find happiness? Where do we find happiness? And in hopes to help clarify this this morning, I went to the best place I could think of about to get the best example of happiness and ask them the question, what brings you happiness? I went to the junior high. And the reason I went to the junior high is because if you go to the high school, they don't tell you anything because they don't want to look like they're stupid. So they don't tell me anything that's helpful. And so I went to the junior high and guess what? I got zero things that were helpful from the junior hires. So I did the next best thing. I pulled out my phone and I Googled it. Right? Because Google can't be wrong. So I Googled it, and I said, Google, almighty Google, what makes me happy? What brings happiness to me? And the first article I read was from Psychology Today, and this is what it says. It says that happiness is when your life fulfills your needs. And I was so blown away by it that I screenshotted it. So this is the screenshot for you. Happiness is when your life fulfills your needs. And then it proceeds to give you all of these places that you can fulfill your needs. The first one is money. You want to be happy? Acquire as much money as you possibly can. And some of you are ready to shake your head because you know that's not true. It seems like the more money you have, the more frustrated you get because someone else has more money than you have, so you got to acquire more money. It's just like this never-ending pursuit. The second thing on the list is stuff like cars or houses. I already gave you an example of how the car thing doesn't work because there's always a better, newer car, faster. Houses are the same thing, right? You buy a house, you think it's really cool, but then someone else has a cooler house in a better neighborhood in a better school district. Ah. So you move to that one. And then you're there for a little bit, but then the school district is not as cool as the other school district, so then we have to move to that school. And it's this never-ending game of finding the coolest, the happiest thing to make me happy. So money can't bring me happiness, long term. might bring it for a short time. 
my stuff can't bring me happiness. The third thing it says is, if those things don't work, pursue relationships. You find the right guy and they'll make you happy. You find the right girl and they'll bring you oodles of joy and happiness. And then they clarify that because it's based off of your needs and happiness fulfilling your needs, you get into a relationship and when you're no longer happy, cut ties with it, kick them out and find another relationship that makes you happy because it's all about you and your happiness. So then you cut it and then you kick them out because they don't make you happy anymore and it keeps going. That's what this article said. Kick them out if they're not making you happy anymore. And you and I know that if we keep pursuing relationships like that, we'll never be happy. We'll always have to cut ties with somebody and always have to find someone else. It's temporary happiness. Because it doesn't matter, happiness is not found in your family, although they may be awesome. It's not found there. Happiness is not found in a career, although that may be cool as well. Happiness isn't found even in retirement. We live in a culture that Phrases that, right? Just wait till retirement and it'll be the best thing ever. Happiness isn't found there either. Happiness isn't found in a political party. Happiness isn't even found sometimes in your own church. Although, I think this church is pretty cool. And I love what God's doing here. Happiness isn't always found in this place. So if Google is wrong, which I think they are, Where do we find happiness? Where do we find happiness? And as believers, as people who follow Jesus, the only answer is wherever God says it is. We find happiness in God and where he says we can find happiness. In Psalm uh, 144.15, so we're we're read the beginning of a psalm, right? At the beginning, at the end of Psalms, it uses the same word, Blessed. And it says, blessed is the people of whom this statement's true. Blessed is the people whose God is Lord. And this cool thing is actually interchangeable in the book of Psalms. Every time you read the word blessed, you can also be translated or happy is the person. Or happiness to this person. Or abundant life to this person. So if you read it like that, it says, happy is the people of whom this is true. Happy is the people whose God is the Lord. You want happiness? Make God your Lord is what they would say. Ecclesiastes chapter two, verse 26 says, to the person who pleases him, God, God gives three things, wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. God is the giver of happiness. God is the one that if we want to find true happiness, we have to find it in him. And how he chose to give us happiness is in Jesus. Happiness comes from complete Surrender, not partial surrender, not a little bit of surrender, but complete surrender to Jesus. Nowhere else can you find happiness unless you surrender to that. Because at the beginning of time, we talk about this almost every week, God made us in his image and he made us to have a relationship with him and he sent Jesus, God in flesh, to be among us, to be with us and when we have a relationship with him, we are fulfilling our purposes. We find our truest identity. So happiness comes when I finally completely surrender to Jesus and his plan. When I completely surrender to God and his purpose for me. And the mission that Jesus has for all of us. Happiness comes in complete surrender to Jesus. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said this, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Or another translation says, I have come that they may have life and have life abundantly. I have come to give them life so they can have true happiness. Jesus wants you to be happy. He's hardwired you for that. But it doesn't come through things. It comes in complete surrender to him. It comes in proximity to Jesus because happiness is a byproduct of being with Jesus. Here's how I know that. There's this Greek word, It says diatribo, and it should be on the screen here a second. There you go, diatribo, and it means to spend time together or rubbing off on each other. 
every time Jesus invites someone to follow him, every time Jesus went somewhere together and he would invite people along on this journey with him, it uses this word diatribo. Jesus would do something and he would invite his disciples to rub shoulders with him, to see how he did things. And he invited them not to just sit down with him. Jesus was very missionally driven. Jesus knew what he was doing. He had it three years and he was on his way to the cross to die for you, to die for me, and then to raise victorious back to life and send people on a mission to help people glorify God. That's what he was here for. And he invited people to be a part of the process, to rub shoulders with him to see how he did things, to see how he loved people, to see how he invited people into a relationship with him. And then he sent the disciples to do the same thing. That the longer and longer they spent with Jesus, the more they looked like him, the more they talked like him, the more they loved like him, the more they were on mission for the kingdom of God like him. He rubbed off on them. And God wants to do the same thing for you. Jesus wants to invite you so close to be a part of his life in such a deep and meaningful way that his happiness, his joy, his passion, his love, his grace, his mercy begins to rub off on you. So that when people see you, all they see is Jesus. If you fast forward a few years after Jesus was risen and went into heaven, um, we have in the book of Acts this really cool story where the disciples are before the Sanhedrin. They are this group of leading Jewish people. And Peter and John and all of them are talking and talking about what God is doing, what God did through Jesus. And the Sanhedrin takes note and says, man, I don't agree with these guys, but I, we're taking note that these guys have been with Jesus. These hillbillies from Galilee, these nobodies from that area have been with Jesus. It's a night and day difference. And we can tell. And God wants to do the same thing in you. When people run into you, that you've been so close to Jesus that people say, I don't agree with you necessarily, but I can tell that you've been with Jesus. Because happiness is a byproduct of being with Jesus. Happiness is a byproduct of being Jesus. When you're with him, you can't help but fall in love with the things that he loves. Be helped but fall in love with the mission he has and the world he has. And it comes from being in proximity to Jesus. So with that as our lens to view this through, let's read this passage together again. Psalm 1, starting in verse 1. Blessed. Remember, you can interchange that word with happiness or happy be the person. So happiness to the one Who does not walk and step with the wicked? You want to be happy? Don't walk the way that people who don't love Jesus walk. Live the way that Jesus has called you to live. Or stand in the way that sinners take. You want to be happy? Don't pursue the same things that people who reject God reject uh, uh, pursue. Instead, pursue the things that God has called you to. Or sit in the company of mockers. You want to be happy? And have true happiness, be super careful about who you surround yourself with. Because you start to act and to think and to feel like they do. So surround yourself with God and his people and the things he has for you. Happy is the person whose delight or joy or happiness is in the law of the Lord. God's word brings happiness. Knowing it, loving it, brings you happiness. And it goes on to say, who meditates on this law day and night. It's not just something we pull out when it's convenient to us. It's not just something that we're like, man, I don't feel kind of cool today, so I'm gonna read the Bible and hopefully it'll bring me joy. This is a day and night thing. Embedding yourself so much into God's word and what he has for you and the plans he has for you and the dreams and the joys he has for you that you can't help but be happy. Because God is reminding you constantly of who you are. And then it doesn't end there. And I love this. This last verse describes what it looks like to be near God. And it says this, that person, that happy person is like a tree that is planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season. And whose leaf does not wither, whatever whatever they do prospers. You want to have a life that's fulfilling? You want to have a life that's full of happiness and joy, you plant yourself near Jesus. 
In John chapter four, Jesus went to this town called Sychar and he met this woman at a well during the daytime. He had sent his disciples into the city and they're having this conversation. He says, hey, can you give me some water? And they dialogue back and forth. She's like, I don't think you wanna talk to me. Do you know who you're talking to? I mean, I'm not Jewish. You're Jewish. Why are you talking to me? Why are we interacting? And they have this really cool conversation. And finally, she's like, I don't think you want water from me. And Jesus replies, I think if you knew who I was, you would ask me for living water and I'd give it to you. You'll never thirst again. And they exchange back and forth and she finds out that he's the Messiah, he's the rescuer, he's the one who's gonna pull her out of her troubles and give her new life. And she goes away excited and tells the whole town about the experience she just had with Jesus. Over and over again, Jesus uses words like, I am the living water, or I am the bread of life. Jesus uses these words of, if you come to him and you embed yourself next to him, you will have a life fulfilled of happiness. Not of perfection, because I think we try to associate happiness and perfection together, but of happiness, a good life, the way that God designed you from the beginning to have, and that's a life with him in it. So Jesus invites us to embed ourselves next to him and to bear fruit. And this cool thing happens in that passage in John chapter four. He actually says that if you come to me, you will have living water coming out of you as well. And in other passages, he talks about how then you get to invite other people to be alongside you as you're alongside Jesus and they get to experience what this living water, this living life is like because you have chosen to embed yourself next to Jesus. In Matthew 25, he tells the story about how um, these people were really good workers for for their king and how every time the king saw them, they came to the city, he's like, blessed are you, come and enjoy your master's happiness. God loves to invite us into his happiness. God loves for us to invite us into what he's doing in the world. And part of that comes from also what we have been commanded and sent to do. God designed us and commanded us to do three things. One, to bring him glory. It's how you're designed from the very beginning. Two, to have relationships with people that are his people. And three, to have relationships with people that are far from God, that don't know God, that don't know their loss and need Jesus. We call that the Great Commission if you're around churches long enough. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We invite them to be a part of what God is doing and designed them to be. So here's what I want to do with the last few minutes we have together. I want to remind us of that calling of embedding ourselves in Jesus. In your pews are these lovely cards that I cut for you this week. Some of them didn't make it to the pew because I cut them incorrectly and they were terrible looking and so I threw them away. But this card is there. Here's what I want us to do together. I want us to take time over the next couple minutes to reflect. I'm a student pastor and I think it's really important that we dialogue and we engage and we do things together. And I want you to take three areas. It's not a coincidence that our church's mission is to glorify God by being disciples to make disciples. It's the command that God has given us and I want you to be a part of it because God is calling you to be a part of it. So I want you to take a pen. There's some pens in the pews in front of you if you'd like. And I want you to take time to reflect and number these in the little boxes. Because remember, you're designed for three relationships. The first one is your relationship with God. On a scale of one to 10, one being super poor, and 10 being phenomenal. How is your relationship with God? How would you rate yourself? Then I want you to do the same thing for the next two boxes, the one with the church. How is your relationship with God's people? The people that he calls you to surround yourself with, to encourage you, to help you draw deeper to God. How is that on a scale of one to 10? And then the last box, I want you to do the same thing with the lost. How are you reaching people who are far from God, who don't know God, who need to be invited into what God is doing and calling them and made them for? One through 10. And then here's what I want you to do, because I think we do a disservice to people sometimes in churches. We tell you to reflect and we just send you away and hope that you do something about it. I don't want that for you today. Our church doesn't want that for you. 
our leadership. We want to hand you tools to take a next step with Jesus. So I want you to do that. And then once you do, identify which one is the lowest number you have. And then flip over the page. On the back are some next steps you can take. If you are struggling with your relationship with God, here's some next steps you can take to further that relationship, to grow in that relationship and be a part of God's mission. If you're struggling to thrive as a family, if you're struggling to have relationships with God's people, then here's some next steps for you. And I'm going to say it very bluntly. If you just come on Sunday mornings, you don't have a relationship with God's people. If they're not embedded into other aspects of your life, if you don't see them throughout the week, you're not in a relationship with God's people. You come to a room together and go, woohoo, and leave. It's not the same. You need God's people in your life. And the last one is go. Maybe you feel inadequate. Maybe you're like, I have no idea how to tell people about Jesus. Well, we don't want that for you either. We have coaching days. We have uh, training days where we purposely give you tools that you can walk out with and help people love Jesus. And if you want to be a part of it, we would love to do that. And maybe you're sitting here thinking, you're like, man, I think I have a next step I need to take, but it's not any of these things. Don't worry. This is not like an all-inclusive list. This are just some things, right? If you want help identifying stuff, at the end of this service, right out those doors, there's a next steps table. I'll be out there, James and some of our other staff will be out there, and we'd love to talk to you about what it looks like to take a next step with Jesus, whatever it may be. So if you've made Jesus your king, identify before you leave this room, what is my next step today? What am I going to do for the mission and the kingdom of God? Some of you here, though, may have never made that decision. Maybe you've never surrendered to Jesus and made him your king. And what that looks like around here, that first step into surrendering to Jesus is through baptism. We lower you into the water and we raise you up into a new life. The old self that was sinful, the old self that was rebellious, you can die in the water. And you can be a new creation. The Bible is very clear about that, that if anyone is surrendered to Jesus, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old life is gone. The new life has come. We want to invite you to that today. To be a part of the mission and the kingdom of God and to surrender yourself to being by his side. And if you need help in either of those places, come find us at the next steps table today. We're going to sing one more song and then we're going to be sent from this place on mission for the kingdom. Would you bow your heads as we pray? God, we love you. We're so grateful for your son, Jesus, and the opportunity we've been given to be changed by you and your word. To surrender our lives, our identity, our everything to your mission and your kingdom. May we do everything we can to bring you glory and honor. Not for our sakes, but for yours, people who don't know you. Thank you for today. May we not squander it, but use every opportunity we can to help everybody come to you, to thrive as a family, to go on mission. You are a God of hope, and we can find it in happiness. The way that you described, the way that you've given us happiness. In your name we pray, the mighty powerful name of Jesus.